Welcome back to Operating Systems. In today's lecture, we are taking a look at how files are stored on external storage media like hard disks or SSDs. So file systems is today's topic. So, so far we have considered mostly resources which we might consider internal to your computer, so your CPU and your main memory. Then we had a look at I.O. devices and how to handle block-oriented devices. So how to, for example, do scheduling of blocks on a disk. And today we're taking a closer look at this background storage and how this is actually realized. So we're all over here in the secondary storage area, which is just another I.O. device. But this I.O. device has quite a lot of abstractions and software stacked on top of it, which we're going to examine today. So you might remember the slide from one of our first lectures in this course. So you've seen this schematic description of a disk before. So you have this physical representation of data on a disk, where data is stored as bits, essentially as magnetic transitions on disks of yeah, magnetic material, obviously. And these disks are split into concentric circles we call tracks, and each section of a track is split again into a part which we call a sector and this sector is the basic element of allocation on a disk for example a 512 byte sector and hard disks are accessed using a head number so in this example we have six heads here covering the six surfaces of our disk and then a track and a sector number more modern disks already make this easier for the programmer of, for example, the device driver by mapping just a linear logical section, sector number to a combination of head number, track number and sector number. But still, if you would want to access your data just using an index number on your disk, that would be very tedious. So essentially what the operating system has to do is to provide a higher level abstraction to make it simple for application programs and ultimately humans to work with data stored on a disk. And this is done by providing a so-called file system. So a file system is just a logical view of all the data in the blocks on your disk and file systems enable permanent storage of large amounts of data here. So for a file system, uh, you have a logical view like this. So usually it's a tree structure where at the root of the tree you have several so-called top-level directories like user or home in this example. And then you can recurse down so you can have directories inside of directories like the bin and local directory here or the home directories for users me, Olaf and Tor. And of course inside of directories you can have files which then contain data you're going to work with, like a PDF file here. And the task of your file system is to map this logical view that is provided into a physical view of your hard disk. And, of course, it has to implement this efficiently, so uh, users will actually want to use this abstraction uh, day by day. Now, Unix takes this view of having files as an abstraction for objects out of the world of just uh, managing disk drives and similar storage media. But Unix actually takes this principle uh, further and says everything in the system should be accessible as a file. This is quoted very often, but we should try to be a bit more precise here. So what does this mean? It actually means that every resource in the system can be accessed using a name which is mapped into a directory hierarchy. And when you try to access this name, these accesses behave as if you would access a regular file on a hard disk, even though you don't need any backing storage for certain amounts or certain types of file. But Having access to any resource using the standard Unix system calls for file access, so open, read, write, and close, for example, makes life easier for the programmer. Because now it doesn't really matter if the programmer is working on a real file or on some sort of pseudo file, or as we've seen the last time on some sort of device special file. Uh, the program works all the same. So this Unix philosophy of 
uh, having programs that do one small thing well and then interact with other programs in more complex interactions like shell pipelines. This is supported by this Unix principle of everything being a file because yeah, these files are the basis or this file abstraction is the basis for being able to use file descriptors to read stuff, for example, over standard in, standard out for doing I.O. redirection. An additional advantage of representing everything looking like a file is that you can actually have access control to these resources, which are not real files on a hard disk, but just pseudo files. And this can be done by regular permissions to the files. So our user group and others permissions, which you've seen already the permission bits here, and you can use them for whatever is represented as a file, no matter if it's a file on your hard disk or something completely different. So examples for things represented by a file in Unix are obviously regular files and also directories. You can open a directory like a file and read the contents if you like. We've already seen special files for devices. We have things like symbolic links, which are just references to a different name in a file system. So you can actually give an object in your file system a different name that also lives in a different directory. And we've also seen named pipes in our discussion of inter-process communication before. And we can also have virtual files, for example, that provide information about our current state of our processes and of our operating system. Now, Unix has implemented this starting in the 1970s, but in the 1980s, new technologies came along and were integrated into Unix, especially TCP IP networking in the Berkeley BSD Unix system. And this TCP IP networking was using a different API. So TCP IP networks in most Unixes are not implemented as files. So you cannot just open a file that says slash TCP slash IP address slash port number and then read a web page, for example, from port 80, which is represented as a file, but you have to use the socket API we've already seen in our discussion of APC, IPC. However, follow-up projects to the Unix operating system at Bell Lab, for example, the Plan 9 and Inferno operating systems, actually took this to the extreme. So Plan 9 provides a special communication protocol called 9P, and this enables really everything in the system to be represented as a file. So you can open a network description, uh, a network connection, by just reading a pseudo file in your file system instead of having to deal with separate calls, for example, to a socket library. So you can represent network connections and protocols and even other resources, like, for example, an access to the graphics frame buffer of your GPU using just simple files in the Plan 9 OS. In our previous lecture, we already gave you a quick overview of how to access files. So we have already seen that files are identified by so-called file descriptors in the operating system. And the file descriptors are local to the process, so they are not globally unique, but only locally inside of a process. So the operating system has to keep a table of the file descriptors used by every process, which is usually in the process control block. Now, a file descriptor is simply a number, a positive integer number, and this is a number that can also be reassigned when it's no longer used for its uh, intended original pro uh, purpose. And we've already seen that the Unix file access API consists of these four general simple system calls. So to gain access to a file, you use the open system call and you pass it a path to a file. So just a name, optionally including a, a full or part of the directory hierarchy, indicating where to find this name. You pass it a set of flags that indicate the mode with, with which you want to access the file. So do you want to read it? Do you want to write it? Do you want to do both? Do you maybe want to create it if you want to write it, if it hasn't existed before? And there's an optional parameter which can be used to, for example, uh, configure the access permissions for a newly created file. So open attempts to open the file with a given pass name and the options for accessing. So read only, read write, and so on. Uh, if, and if this succeeds, uh, actually, the operating system allocates a new file descriptor for this file. So this is a one-to-one -one relation of this file name here to uh, this file descriptor. And this is returned to our process so it can be used 
to refer to this file in subsequent calls. Now, if there's an error, as usual, it returns a negative number, so you have to figure out what has gone wrong. So, for example, things that can go wrong is that the file you give here does not exist, or that the file you give is not accessible by you because you don't have access permissions, or that you want to try to write to a file for which you have only read permissions. So when you have opened a file, you have access to the data of that file. So now you can read from that file using the read system call. And here you see you don't pass a path name to read and write, but only this file descriptor, which you have to obtain initially by calling open. And then read, for example, uh, can be told to read a number of bytes from that file descriptor into a buffer here for which you have to pass a pointer and write does the opposite operation. So given a file descriptor and a number of bytes to write, then the operating system takes care of writing this number of bytes from the buffer, so the pointer you pass to write, into the file described by your file descriptor. And finally, when you don't want to use that file anymore, you can close this file. So this usually flushes the buffers to that file. So it ensures that, for example, if this is a real file stored on your disk, that all data in internal buffers is written back to the file. And uh, so uh, afterwards, this file descriptor that we pass to close is no longer accessible. So when we try to do a read or write after doing a close on a file descriptor, we are returned an error message. And we've seen an additional call, which is especially important for block devices and also for regular files, the LC call, which allows us to position our read and write pointer arbitrarily inside of the file. And this means our read and write operation can start at an arbitrary position inside of the file instead of having to read and write from the start of the file every time we want to access our file. Now, to support this illusion that everything is a file in the system, Unix needs to have a bit of an elaborate software infrastructure inside of the kernel to create this illusion. So, for example, on our user level, we have several application processes like a web browser here, a web server, and a C compiler. So, these only access files given names, and usually they don't know what's behind this file. So, is it a file on a disk? Is it maybe a file on a network share, like down here? Or is it some sort of special file that's not actually backed by some physical information on the disk or on the network? So, for example, you can read out parts of your process state in the PROC file system or parts of your system information in the SYS file system on a Linux system. So these file systems for process and system information are called pseudo file systems and they can just simulate arbitrary files without having to store them anywhere. So whenever a request comes in, for example, our web server has received a request to re-deliver a web page, and so it needs to open this web page. So let's say it's stored at this directory location, surf www, and inside of this directory we have a file index.html, and we want to open it just for reading here. Then this request is passed to our kernel, and the kernel has a generic functionality that actually can map a certain file name here, our pass name, surf www, index.html, to a certain file system which is mounted, so which is known to the system, at a certain mount point. So for example, we always have a root file system. This root file system might reside on a hard disk, and this root file system might be of a specific type called X4, which is one of the standard Linux file systems. However, we might have decided to store all of our web pages on a separate disk with a separate file system here the XFS file system, and we have decided to make this disk contents here available under a separate pass name. So this is attached to the root, but it's under a directory in root called SRV, which usually stands for surf or server. And finally, we might have, for example, home directories for our users that are accessible over the network. So we have a different file system called the network file system or NFS, which then uses the Ethernet controller to access a resource somewhere on your local net or even on the internet. So what happens when this request comes in? This virtual file system switch functionality actually looks up if there is some information about on which file system 
something is stored and it figures out, okay, the first part of, your pa of our path here is surf. We have an information for surf that it's stored on the XFS file system on that disk here. So essentially we pass this request here to open that file down to that XFS file system information, which then has to figure out on its disk if there is a file called www index.html if it is successful. And if this is the case, then it can actually return success. Our virtual file system switch can ex uh, allocate a file descriptor, which is then returned to our web server so it can start reading the web page. So we've seen if we want to connect multiple file systems into our file system hierarchy, which as we know is a tree structure, uh, we need to be able to tell our system to attach this file system somewhere in our structure. So for example, uh, our original structure here on our hard disk would look like this. We have a root file system and on the first level in the root file system we have three directories. Surf, which is currently an empty directory, a home directory with a directory me below it, and the proc file system with pseudo files below it. So what we want to do now is we want to make this other file system consisting of, for example, our web server files like index.html, one of our web pages, and maybe an SVN or Git repository tree below it. And we want to make this accessible to our system. And we want the root of our file system we want to attach to our system to be available as the contents of the surf directory. So what we have to do here is we have to mount this. So to attach this uh, yeah, separate tree of file system to our major tree, which is connected to our global root of our file system. And we do this by using the mount system call. So here we benefit from the fact that also special devices like a hard disk partition are just represented as files in a file system. So we can just mount and give this special name like slash dev. We've seen in our previous lecture, all the special files are usually located in dev. And we've seen SDA1 would be the first partition on the first SCSI hard disk. So we say, uh, dear operating system, please uh, try to attach this block device here and attach it at our current directory slash SRV and the file system type should be an XFS file system. So the general semantics for our system call is, uh, well, the name is mount, obviously, then we pass the source. So usually the name of a block device we want to mount, we pass the target, so the name of the directory in our global directory hierarchy we want to attach it to. Uh, then we pass a string giving a type of a file system, for example, XFS, or it could be a FAT file system for a USB stick, for example. And then we can also have some flags for mounting, for example, indicating if you want to have it read mounted or read write mounted, and so on. So this attaches a file system to the given directory in the global directory tree. If this succeeds, then we can go from slash to surf to www to index.html over here to access our web page. And when we no longer need this uh, subtree of our directory hierarchy attached, we can also call umount. And for umount, we just have to pass the name of the directory, for example, where it's attached, or we can also pass the name of the block special device. Both should work. Now, uh, this removes the attachment, so afterwards, all these files here are no longer accessible in our global file system hierarchy. And this can be, for example, used when you have a removable hard disk or a USB stick, then our system usually automatically now detects it. So when you plug a USB stick into your USB port, your system detects, okay, there's a new USB device, and it automatically mounts this to, for example, a, a, a special directory uh, depending on your Linux distribution. And when uh, well, you decide to eject a USB stick, then the operating system calls umount for you for the USB stick. And umount not only makes this directory hierarchy part unavailable, but it also takes care that before this is made unavailable, all open write requests are fulfilled. So all data that's still in buffers uh, for files that belong to any of the files or directories in this unmounted tree are actually written back. And that's also the cause why you should never just 
remove the USB stick by unplugging it before unmounting it, because in this case some unwritten data might still be only in the operating system buffer and RAM, but not already been written back to disk, so you might encounter data loss or data even file system inconsistencies when you just remove a USB stick without unmounting it from a Unix system. Now note that uh, some Unix descriptions are strange, so uh, that's also a typo I uh, make a lot of times. So it's not called unmount with an N, but it's just called U-mount, and this is very, one very common typo. Now, of course, you don't want to allow any user of a system to attach arbitrary files to, or file hierarchies to your file system, because they may contain, might contain malware, or programs with permissions uh, that are not uh, acceptable to your system. So they want to, uh, if a user would want to breach the security of your system. And this is of course especially relevant on a server or a multi-user Unix system. So using the mount and also U-mount system call usually requires system administrator privileges. And if you can actually do it as a, a regular user, then the system administrator has granted you the permissions, for example, to be able to mount your own USB stick without having to ask the system administrator to do it for you. So let's now consider regular file storage on a disk, because that's one of the most common use cases for using a file system, obviously. So in most cases, we've seen blocks are small on a disk, like 512 bytes. So a file usually requires to, uh, the allocation of multiple blocks of storage on a disk. And for our uh, investigation here, we simply view a disk as a large area of blocks. So we have blocks numbered from 0, 1, 2, and so on. And each block has an identical size, for example, of 512 bytes, as you see down here. So uh, we've already seen this is already an abstraction from the heads, tracks, and sectors that a real disk drive provides. So this abstraction is usually provided by either your disk controller or in very old cases also by the operating system. So the question the operating system has to solve is if we have a request to store a file of a given length, which can be definitely more than 512 bytes, which of the blocks on our disks should we use to store a file? So essentially we need to define a mapping of 512 byte long units of our file to a block on the disk and we need to define this mapping for each of these 512 byte long units that is part of our file. So let's start with a very simple approach just allocating contiguous storage and you might notice some similarity to main memory allocation approaches. Of course it's a very similar idea so you want to allocate storage either in main memory or on disk but it's a bit different here because you also have to allocate storage on disks in blocks of this fixed size. So for contiguous storage, when we want to store a file, then we require that this file is stored in blocks with increasing block numbers. So for example, if we have a file that covers three blocks, we would start, for example, at block two, and then our file would cover block two, three, and also block four. So this approach requires us to store information about the first block. So we need to know for a given file where it starts. And then we only need to store information about how many blocks it actually takes. Because due to this requirement of the blocks being contiguous, we already know automatically when it starts at block two and has a length of three blocks, then it uses blocks two, block three, and block four. Now this is a very simple scheme, obviously, and it has a number of advantages. Uh, so uh, you have access to all blocks with minimal delay because all blocks are one after the other. So when you have positioned your disk arm to access the first block, then the other blocks are directly in close vicinity to that first block. You can have fast direct access to a given file offset position because you can just seek to the file offset linearly. And this is obviously not optimal, but still it's used, especially for file systems where you don't reorganize data, where you don't create data when a system is running, but only use data in a fixed format. So this is used for read-only file systems, for example, on CD-ROMs or DVDs, where you can ex essentially afford to create such an order of contiguous blocks here 
without having to care about whether uh, yeah, uh, these blocks have to be rearranged or not. So for read-only media, this is pretty much a good idea. Of course, this has a number of problems. So especially when you want to use such a file system organization to uh, be in a live file system, so in a system where you can uh, create and delete files and also grow files while the system is running, because this requires you to find free space on the disk. So when you want to store a file of a certain size, you need to find a sufficiently large gap of continuous, contiguous free blocks on your disk. And if this is not available, even though you have enough blocks available, then uh, you might fail your allocation or you would have to reshuffle all the blocks around to create a larger block. So this would require copying and copying on a disk is orders of magnitude slower, obviously, than copying in main memory. So that's something you want to avoid. So uh, when you create and delete files, as with main memory allocation on the heap, we've seen we create fragmentation. So this creates free blocks that cannot be used for future allocations since they are too small for a given file. And the size of new files is usually not known in advance, so files can grow. And if you want to extend, so grow the size of a file because you want to add data to it, and there's no free blocks directly behind the last block of that file, then you have to copy data around again to make some more space. So obviously, this is a pretty inefficient approach, but it works well for this read-only scenario we've described on the previous slide. So let's try a more advanced approach, and you've already seen this approach also for uh, heap allocation. So uh, let's try a linked list. So a linked list means that the blocks belonging to a file are linked. So we don't need a contiguous order anymore, but we can just allocate a set of three blocks here. So for example, blocks 3, 8, 1, and 9 to our file. Uh, we indicate which block is the first one. So block three would be the first one. And then in each block, we store a pointer, so an information uh, that indicates which block is the next block in our file. So here in block three, we would indicate in our pointer that the next one is at block eight, then at block one, then at block nine. And the final block just indicates that there is no further block. So our file occupies four blocks on the disk. And this was actually used, for example, in 1980s home computers from Commodore as a format on the disk drives, for example, for the famous Commodore 64 computer. Uh, this machine had a block size of 256 bytes. And uh, by convention, the first two bytes of each block here contained the track and sector number of the following blocks. So this was uh, on floppy disks. So floppy disks on the Commodore 64 had like 35 tracks. And each track had, uh, I think, 18 sectors. Uh, don't, don't count on this. I'd have to check this. So essentially, both values comfortably fitted inside of a single byte each. So uh, indicate an indication of a track number of zero here. So in our final block would indicate that this is actually the end of our file. Uh, now, of course, this was a bit problematic because this implied that you had to reserve two of the bytes in each block for storing the uh, pointer to our next data block. So this means you only have 254 bytes, so not a nice power of two, available for the payload, for, so for the data that is part of your file. This works, this has worked amazingly well, and this enables you to extend a file or to shrink a file. So by extending a file, uh, you only need to find another free block and attach it to the end, or by shrinking a file, you can just remove some blocks from your linked list. So obviously, this is also not ideal. We've already seen that the available storage for data is reduced by the amount of memory used for pointers. And this could be especially problematic when you want to implement paging using this approach, because then a memory page, with, which is always a nice power of two, as we've seen, would always require parts of two or more disk blocks instead of fitting nicely into one disk block. This is error prone because if one of the pointers goes wrong and you've already had some fun with pointers in the practical exercises, the same can happen with pointers on disk. So if some of these pointers to the next blocks get corrupted, a file can no longer be completely restored. So you have information loss and having direct access to arbitrary file positions is difficult because you'd have to iterate from the start going through your list until you find the 
required disk block in which the information at the logical file position actually resides. In addition, when you just spread your blocks over your disk, this would require frequent positioning of the diskette when the data blocks are actually spread more or less randomly over the disk. So, of course, people try to improve on this, and one small improvement of, of this is something you have probably already used. This is a so-called FAT file system. So, the FAT file system was introduced with uh, early Microsoft DOS versions in the early 1980s, and the FAT file system actually also uses such a linked structure, but the difference to the uh, system we've seen before is that now links are actually stored in separate disk blocks. So this avoids the problem of having to spare a part of our disk block to store the pointer, but then again we need to store these pointers in separate disk blocks. So the linking looks the same, so we have an indicator for the first file block and then we have pointers indicating when we're at a given block which one is the next one. So for our first file block, which would be that one here, uh, we would say the next file is contained in block number 8, and then the, uh, uh, the next block is contained in block number 8, then the next block would be block number 1, and block number 9, uh, which is then the final block here, which has no subsequent block. Now the difference is that this information which we indicated in the blocks here is not actually stored in the blocks anymore, but we have this so-called file allocation table, which is just a table containing all these pointers to subsequent blocks. So the file allocation table for the uh, block 3 indicates that we have a connection uh, to block 8 and then uh, it indicates the following blocks. So our file still consists of these four blocks here, 3, 8, 1, 9, but this linking here on the left-hand side is a separate file which is actually stored in the file allocation table. So the advantage of using a file allocation table is that the complete contents of a data block is usable, but then we have to store this file allocation table separately, which might already cause uh, yeah, more uh, head movements to be required. But there's another advantage. Uh, you can get rid of the problem of unreliability because of corrupted pointers, because you have this data structure separate now, which means you can create a second copy of it in case one of the copies gets disturbed. So you can switch to the second copy and restore the other one. So by doing this redundant storage of the FAT, you can reduce the probability of an error. But obviously, this is still a rather primitive file system. So, uh, let's discuss the problems of uh, the FAT file system. So, one obvious problem is that we not only have to access disk blocks, but we also have to access at least one additional block when accessing a file, which is the file allocation table. So, in later versions, for example, of DOS, which operated on floppy disks, so where seeking was especially slow compared to hard disks, uh, the operating system actually just cached the file allocation table in memory to increase efficiency. Uh, when we are loading the FAT, the file allocation table, we load unused information because the file allocation table contains links for all the files on our storage medium, not only for the file we want to access. We again have some search overhead like with our linked lists before, so we have to go through that list to find the right data block for a given offset in a file, and when our blocks again are scattered over your disk, then we have to perform frequent positioning of the read-write hat of the disk hat, which can take quite a lot of time. Now, of course, Microsoft had some brilliant programmers, so they figured out that this original file system for the FAT implementation of MS-DOS wasn't quite ideal, so they tried to optimize this a bit, uh, mostly by being compatible. And this optimization was done by introducing so-called chunks, uh, they're also called extents or clusters. So the idea uh, for chunks is that a split is not blocked, uh, is not, uh, that a file is not split into sequences of single, for example, 512 byte blocks, but we have larger sequences of blocks which we actually store contiguously. So, for example, we could try to store eight blocks again contiguously one after the other in a four kilobyte chunk. And this obviously reduces the number of positioning actions we have to take because we know that at least these eight blocks can be read one after the other. And so this improves the speed to search for a block in a linear way. 
obviously depending on the chunk size. Of course, this also uh, introduces a number of new problems. We need additional information to manage the chunks on our hard, hard disk or floppy disk now, and this can again cause fragmentation. So for fixed size chunks, this fragmentation would occur inside of a sequence. So again, we have internal fragmentation, as we've seen with memory allocation before, and with variable size chunks, we could have fragmentation outside of the sequences, so external fragmentation. So let's try to find an even better way to manage files. And a better way is to use so-called index storage. So index storage uses a special block on the disk that just contains the block numbers of the data blocks of a file in order. So this special block, uh, which contains the index of a file, just contains a list of the blocks belonging to our file. So we know our file is made up of blocks 3, 8, 1, and 9. So we just store the block numbers 3, 8, 1, and 9, one after the other in our index block. Now, this works amazingly well, but of course also has a number of problem problems since the index block is just a regular disk block. There's a limit to the amount of block numbers you can store in that index block. So, uh, the problem here is you would have fragmentation for small files, so you would have to waste a complete index block, for example, even for files that only take up one block. And you would need some sort of mechanism to extend this if you want to also be able to uh, work with files that have more blocks than fit into one of your index blocks. And such an extension has been done by Unix for implementing most Unix file systems. So in Unix, you have an index block with so-called direct blocks. This is a single indirect, a single a zero indirection. So these blocks actually, uh, these entries inside of your index block directly link to a block number here. But if you need larger blocks, then you don't add just another index block here behind this, but you add a pointer to yet another index block. So this is a single indirect block. So if your file, for example, would need more than 10 blocks, then you would allocate another index block and you would just point to this using this single indirect pointer here. So you create a hierarchy. So the first 10 blocks are stored directly, the first 10 block numbers. Then the next 10 block numbers are stored indirectly. So they're linked using the single indirect block to another index block, which then links the blocks. And if you need even more, blocks in your file, then you have a double indirect block, which goes to a hierarchy of depth two of these index blocks. And finally, you can have a triple indirect block, which links to an index block, which contains the addresses of index blocks on the second level, which again, in turn, contain the, uh, the addresses of the index blocks on the third level. And these index blocks now finally contain the addresses of blocks belonging to our file. And this index node is a special node type in Unix, and this is the basis for most Unix file systems. And in Unix, this has a special name. This is called the inode, or which is just short for index node. So inodes can provide you with multiple indexing levels, and it has some advantages. So for short files, all the blocks up to the first 10 blocks in our example here are directly referenced in the inode. So we only need to read this first inode block for short files so we can have quick access to it. But if we need to access blocks further down the file for larger blocks, then we can use the single, double or triple indirection as required here. So uh, we can use these multiple indexing levels. And since inodes already require a block on the disk in any case, uh, Fragmentation is not a problem here for small files, and we can have these multiple levels of indexing to enable the addressing of really large files. But of course, for these large files, we'd have to load multiple blocks in addition to the data blocks of a file, because we would have to traverse through our inode hierarchy to finally get to the block number we want. So this inode storage is still pretty simple because it was invented for systems with relatively small disks. It was invented for systems with low processing power and with uh, yeah, not a lot of main memory. Uh, but of course, you can store data more intelligently. And one approach that is actually uh, used in databases usually to efficiently find records using a search key, where the key space for your search key 
key can be sparsely populated, uh, is also used for more advanced file system. And this is so-called tree sequential storage. So this tree sequential storage actually stores uh, lists of pointers to blocks here. So in our root, it would have an indication that the pointer here to the left of our block indicated by the nine contains just information about blocks from zero to nine. The next pointer here contains information for blocks in between 9 and 21. And the right-hand block contains information for blocks that are larger than 21. So now we can actually check for the block number we want. And let's say it's block number uh, 18. So we figure out 18 is between 9 and 21. So we have to dereference this pointer here to that block here. And then we figure out block number 18 is between 17 and 20. So we uh, follow the middle pointer in that one also. And then this is actually attached to a small list of contiguous blocks where the first block here would be block number 18. And after that, we would also find 19 and 20. So 18, 19 and 20 are used in the file. And these can all be referenced using this pointer because all of these are in between 17 and 20, where 20 is inclusive here. And the rest also works, of course, for the left and right hand side here. And as you can see, we can have also empty parts here. So if we have some sparse source of storage, uh, sparse way of storing our blocks for our file here, we can actually afford to just have a pointer to an empty list, which is just a null pointer as usual. And this tree sequential storage here is quite a bit more advanced. So uh, this can also be used to find these chunks of files with a certain offset. And this is used in more modern file systems. So for example, in NTFS on Windows, in the Linux Better file system, in the Journal File System 2 by IBM, and also by Apple's HFS Plus, which uses a so-called B plus tree to store this uh, information about file blocks. So the next problem when managing space on disk, similar to managing space in main memory, is of course you need to know which space of your disk is actually still unused. And you can do this in a way we've seen before for main memory management. So you can use a bit vector here, so you can indicate for each block on your disk using just one single bit if it is used or not. And you can actually have, uh, well, for example, a block of 512 bytes, which are 4096 bits. So this would have a storage for your first 4096 blocks on your disk, indicating for each block if it's used or not. And of course, you can, if your disk is larger than that, you can link to the next free block that contains the bit information for your next 4096 blocks. So linked lists represent free blocks here. This linking information can be stored in the free blocks themselves. Uh, you can optimize this so you can actually use also information about contiguous free blocks so you don't have to store a bit here for each of these, for example, seven free blocks down here, but you could try to store the information. Okay, from this point on, we have seven free blocks. So this would store the information in a single piece here. Yeah, so the optimization here is one free block contains many block numbers of additional free blocks and possibly also this additional free number. So this free space management is very simple, usually by implementing this bit vector stuff. But since we're always managing blocks of fixed size, this is very efficient because we only have to spend one bit for each block. Instead, for example, for main memory management, if we don't do main memory management in blocks, we would have to, for example, store a bit for every byte or word, whatever the granularity with, which is far less efficient than to using it on large blocks as here. Now, of course, you can also try more advanced methods here. So you could use this tree sequential storage approach for uh, indicating used disk blocks. Of course, also for indicating free disk block sequences. This would enable faster search for a free sequence of blocks of a given size. And this is also used in practice, for example, in the XFS file system by Silicon Graphics. Now, so far, we have considered how to store blocks of a file. So the other thing we have to consider when we want to build a file system is how to store the information about where these files should be located in our file system hierarchy. So we need to create directories 
containing information about files. So the most simple way of doing directory management is actually to create lists. So a directory would be a disk block again, or maybe multiple disk blocks. And these disk blocks are split into entries of identical lengths that are stored one after the other in the list. And each of these entries represents a file name plus meta information, for example, on where to find the file on the disk. So for our FAT file system, for example, a file name consists of eight characters for the file name plus three characters of the extension. You've already seen this like in windows.exe. And then you have additional information as part of your disk block containing attributes of the file. So for example, read write information. And then you can store information about the creation date, the last access and change date. And finally, the important information for being able to access the file. So this already stores the first data block number and then the subsequent blocks have to be referenced in the FAT, and it also stores information about the length of a file. Now, if you've used the FAT file system, you might wonder, uh, but I can now also create files with longer file names than 8 plus 3 on my FAT file system. This is possible, and this is actually using a hack. So long file names in VFAT actually extend uh, using multiple directory entries. So that's the trick actually to store these long file names and the file system handler, the file system implementation actually knows how to handle this. If you actually manage to attach a FAT file system with long file names to a system just supporting these old 8 plus 3 file names, you might have seen these silly abbreviations of uh, whatever short name tilde uh, something point uh, extension this is an indication that there is actually an extension to the file name, which cannot be understood by a more simple FAT file system implementation. Now, original Unix systems were even simpler for uh, in storing directory na uh, fi uh, file names for directories. So a directory entry just consisted of 16 bytes. So the last 14 bytes of our directory entry were just the file name. So in original Unix, File names were restricted to a length of 14 characters only, which is a bit restrictive, but still a bit more than fat file names. And the first two bytes here just store the inode number. So the inodes are stored separately on disk as we've seen. So we just store the inode number that contains the root level inode, or maybe single inode for a file as the first two bytes of our directory entry. And then when we want to access a file given a name here, we know we just have to look up the inode and from the inode, we can get direct or indirect access to all the blocks of a file. Now, uh, a directory then contains a number of these entries. So for example, a 512 byte block here would contain 512 divided by 16, so 32 different file entries. And if a directory extends further, we need more blocks to be allocated to that directory. Since a directory is also just a, a type of a file in Unix, also directories again are managed, so the blocks belonging to directories are managed using inodes. So this is a nice thing of having everything as a file in Unix. You don't need to do anything special in order to create directories. Now, of course, there's a problem because these file names are one after the other in a directory. We have to do a linear search for a given entry, so they're not sorted alphabetically or something, but just maybe sorted in the way they are created. And uh, when you try to sort the list, so you can try to cache directory entries in memory like you do for the FAT, you could do a sorting of the list to enable faster search and to reduce insertion overhead in directories. This is very useful when you have directories with large numbers of small files. So you had optimizations for this, for example, for email progress, when you have like 5,000 emails in a mailbox here, each of these emails is originally stored in a separate, very small file. And this creates a very large directory. So uh, introducing caching for directories like these uh, for example, improve the speed of mail handling on Unix significantly for early Unix systems. Now, of course, you can improve this even further. 
So you can use hash functions. So a hash function maps a file name to a directory in the directory list and we uh, to an index in the directory list. And we've seen hash, hash functions before in this course. So hash functions enable faster access to the entry because we no longer need a linear search. We only have to calculate this hash, hash function, which is much faster. So essentially from the, for example, characters of our file name, we could create an index, which we then can access directly to find the a directory entry that belongs to a file name. So very simple, but of course, very bad example for a hash function would be just to use the ASCII character values of your file name and sum them together and then take uh, the rest of the division uh, by the number of uh, directory entries we have available here. So this would create a large number of collisions, obviously. So multiple file names mapped to the same entry. So we would have to find a solution for this. And also we would have to find solutions to adapt the list uh, size. If our directory is full, then our hash function has to change. So this is all quite messy. One problem we have seen with previous directory management approaches is that the name of files a uh, name length of files was limited, so to 8 plus 3 characters for FAT file systems or to 14 characters for the original Unix file system. So, of course, this is a bit restricting, so people really figured out how to store long file names without wasting a large space for reserve, uh, that is reserved for long file names in each directory entry when most file names are relatively short, especially on Unix, where people commonly don't love to type that much, so they abbreviate command names to ls or cd instead of typing list or change directory. And so uh, what was invented, for example, in 4.2 BSD, and this was also adapted in later versions of System 5 Unix, like Release 4, is that these systems now provide directories with variable names, uh, length file names. So such a directory entry also includes an inode number. Then as the next field, it doesn't start with the first character of the name, but it contains a pointer, so an offset to our next valid entry here then it contains information about the length of our name, and then it contains the characters of our name after that, and then we can find our next directory entry when we follow that offset pointer to the next entry. Now again, because we have variable list entries, we have to do free storage management for directories all over again. So this is also not an ideal solution, but it makes using your system more flexible. So you have to manage free entries in the list and you can have fragmentation again when you delete a file with a long file name and try to create a file with a shorter file name and then delete this again and then maybe you won't find a space for long file names again. So you have to copy this around again, which again is tedious and takes quite a lot of time. So this is a trade-off between creating comfort for the user or programmer by being able to create really long file names and the efficiency of your directory management. So now we've seen all the components that are required, for example, for a Unix file system. So we've seen we need inodes, we need data blocks. So what does this uh, file system organization then actually look on the disk? Let's first look at a very simple example for the System 5 file system again. And this System 5 file system has a static organization. So there are two reserved blocks at the beginning of the disk. The very first block, block 0, is the boot block. So this contains a so-called boot sector, which is a very, very small machine language program that is loaded from the disk or your floppy disk, whatever, when your system is started. And this program then which is only maximum 512 bytes in length, is then responsible for loading the rest of your operating system from disk. So this has to be very, very efficient. So the next block actually, so block with index one, is our so-called super block. And our super block contains management data for the file system. So this super block actually uh, describes the file system that is contained on this disk or disk partitions. So uh, it contains information about the number of blocks and the number of inodes on that disk. It contains information about the current number and uh, a list of free blocks and inodes. And it can also contain some attributes. So for example, a flag that indicates if the file system was modified since it was last mounted, because if it was modified, then obviously we have to write it back to disk, uh, any information on that file system uh, before we can unmount it. Uh, after our super block, we have a contiguous uh, range of blocks containing the inodes for files. And after the inodes, 
we have our data blocks and data blocks are used for storing files they're used for storing directories and they can also be used for storing additional index blocks here so the inodes here at the start only contain the first level inodes and every additional inode is allocated as a regular data block later on now the problem with the system 5 file system in addition to the short file names is it was relatively slow because you, uh, when you want to access a file, you'd always have to go through to the beginning where your inode blocks are stored, have to reference the inode block, and then have to move your diskette again to where your actual file block is stored. So uh, researchers at the University of Berkeley in California thought there must be a better way to do this. And uh, of course they did, and they called it the Berkeley Fast File System. So the name really said what they wanted to achieve. They had relatively fast hard disks now, and they wanted to have the operating system to be able to access this data on these fast disks also in a relatively fast way. So we have a bit of a different block organization and now uh, data was not spread over the whole disk but it was ordered in sets of so-called cylinder groups. So a set of these cylinders, so your concentric tracks on your disk, was taken together as a group and this was done to minimize the disk has movement. So again you had a boot block at the start of your disk then the uh, block after this is your super block containing the metadata. And then for each cylinder group, you have the super block. You have a cylinder group block describing information about the cylinder group. So a, a, a cylinder group is a set of contiguous cylinders, for example, 16. And the cylinder group, uh, group block now uh, contains information about the inodes, the data blocks, and the used and free blocks in the cylinder group only. And uh, as long as you could keep your data inside of a cylinder block here, so data belonging to a file, you, the amount of seeks you had to do was greatly reduced because the uh, range you had to seek was now reduced to like 16 different cylinders or tracks instead of having to seek over the whole disk. Of course, when you had larger files, then you would have to use, for example, a second cylinder group or further cylinder groups to store data here. But if it's possible, uh, and this is possible especially for small files, which are very common on Unix, then you can increase the access to your disk significantly. So in this uh, Berkeley fast file system, also our directories are distributed, files of the directories are stored together, and the major advantage, which was uh, the key to success of the fast file system, was this reduced positioning time on the disk. So you might wonder what this looks like in Linux. So one of the standard file systems for Linux is the X2 file system, which had many iterations. So we're currently at X4 with additional functionality. So you might wonder why there's an X2 file system, because there was an original file system just called X, which was already called the extended file system, because the original Unix file system in the very first versions of Linux was the so-called Minix file system, and the Minix file system was essentially just a re-implementation of the System 5 file system we've seen before. You can still configure a Linux system, but you won't find a distribution that uses it right away. That uses this Minix file system as its base file system, but then again you restrict it to, for example, slow handling and these 14 character file names. So everyone uses another file system, and very common for many Linux distributions is this x2 file system or one of its subsequent variants x3 and x4. And this is, has a very similar layout to the BSD fast file systems. So here we don't have uh, cylinder groups again because cylinders are no longer relevant because now we have logical block allocations which not necessarily have to correspond to cylinders whereas Berkeley fast file system was in invented in the early 1980s where you could still figure out if a block on the disk uh, belong to a certain cylinder. So here we have block groups instead of cylinder groups, but still these blocks are contiguous here. So uh, they're just now independent of cylinders. But in essence, uh, the X2 file system works very similar to Berkeley fast file system. Now for X3 and X4, you have additional extensions, like for example, journaling in a file system. And these extensions are a topic we are going to cover in the next lecture. So this concludes our discussion about simple file systems. We've seen that file systems are an operating system abstraction, uh, which is created to make, li make life easier for the programmer and the user because it's easier to remember names of files or directories than just numbers of disk blocks. So a file system has the task of uh, storing logically related information uh, on the disk and representing it as a file we can access. 
And we've seen that very often file systems use a hierarchical directory structure to organize data. So you don't have like a million files in just one directory. File systems are influenced by the hardware. So for disks, for example, physical hard disks, our file system has to take care uh, to structure uh, to, uh, data in a way that the number of positioning uh, sequences is reduced. So the positioning times are minimized or for uh, flash memory, you would have to implement something like where leveling. So uh, where leveling means that you distribute the number of write accesses evenly over your whole flash uh, because the number of write cycles to flash memory is restricted. Uh, so if you have an SSD connected using MSATA or PCIe, you don't have to care about where leveling because usually on these SSDs you have something like an ARM controller on the disk, so it's again an intelligent storage device that takes care of this wear leveling. But if you have flash directly connected, for example, to an embedded CPU, you might want to use a file system that does wear leveling on its own. And file systems are also influenced by the application profile. So for example, the choice of your block size. If you choose blocks that are too small, then you have overhead in your management data structures, which might lead to performance loss. Or in turn, if your blocks are too big, you might have fragmentation, which then wastes disk space. And your application profile also might influence the structure of your directories. So if you regularly search a directories, you might want to have a hash function, which causes more administrative overhead. And if you don't do frequent searches in directories, you might want to go for an easier structure that doesn't provide a hash function. So here are some literature references on file systems. So the first literature reference here, uh, actually de devised by the Berkeley uh, researchers, uh, is a description of the first virtual file system switch. So it's already quite old, was invented uh, like in the mid 80s. Uh, a description of the B plus tree structure that Apple uses in the HFS and the HFS plus file system is, uh, can be found in Inside Macintosh volume two. Uh, a description of the System 5 Unix file system can be found in the standard book on Unix by Maurice Bach, which is uh, especially covering the System 5 operating system. Then the fast file system for Berkeley Unix is described in that paper here. And finally, uh, there's also a paper about the design and implementation of the second extended file system, so X2, which, as you can see, is a decade more recent than the old uh, work at Berkeley on the fast file system. So that's all for today. In the next lecture, we'll take a look at more advanced file system approaches. Uh, and uh, afterwards, we'll continue with uh, other interesting operating system topics. So that's all for today. Thanks for listening. And until next time. Bye.